Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to CORD Connect. My name is Moshe Weitzberg, and I am a member of the CORD Board of Directors. I would like to welcome you to CORD Connect. Our session tonight is on fellowship in international emergency medicine. I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Rebecca Walker is an assistant clinical, clinical professor of emergency medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine, serving as director of postgraduate fellowships and co-director of the fellowship in global health. Dr. Sean Kivlahan is the director of the International Emergency Medicine Fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He is also the incoming chair of the International Emergency Medicine Fellowship Consortium and affiliate faculty at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Dr. Parveen Parmar is the fellowship director and chief of the Division of International Emergency Medicine, as well as associate professor in clinical emergency medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Dr. Parmar's research has focused on the study of health and human rights violations in refugees and internally displaced populations. I can just ask everyone to self-mute your phones and open up your microphones when you're ready to ask questions. I now turn it over to the speakers. All right, thanks guys. Thanks everybody for making the time this afternoon or early evening to be with us and hear about fellowships in international emergency medicine. Our goal tonight is to really get the word out about international emergency medicine fellowships as an opportunity for residents. And really the most important thing why we wanted to talk to Cord about this is because we know all of you are really the, me the key mentors to all of your residents that some of which will potentially be our future fellows. So we think this is a good way to hopefully get the word out and help you understand what it is that we do both in our fellowships and then later on in our careers and what our alumni do, and that you can see it as an option for your residents and also to give you all an opportunity to ask us any questions you have about this career path. So we're just gonna move through and uh, but please, stop me at any time, ask any questions, and I'm happy to stop and answer them. So we'll start with just what exactly is international emergency medicine, because it's kind of a vague term, and many of you have probably heard global health or all of these other terms that are thrown around, and it is a little confusing. So the way I think of it, and there is there is no definite way, but the way that I think of it is global health is kind of everything, taking care of preventable diseases like vaccine care and building hospitals and emergency medicine, just one part of the larger global health picture. But our field as emergency medicine providers is this international emergency medicine, which is the provision or development or advancement of emergency care, access or delivery to populations in the world that may not have access to it. And there's definitely overlap in this skill set between domestic care and international care. And there's definitely many areas in the US that are in need of similar types of care, but we focus more external to the US for this. So one thing is direct clinical care, and that involves maybe just a resident or a fellow will go to a clinical site, whether it's a hospital or a residency training program for some sort of rotation, could be a few weeks or a few months or even longer, and just work as a clinical provider, providing care to patients. And we'll come back to some of these and show you some examples. Education and training is one of the most common ways that people get involved in international EM. And this is when people start a residency program or some sort of certificate program is the most common thing. Many residency programs have opportunities and partnerships with hospitals in other countries, and they'll send their trainees there for a month at a time, a kind of a rotating program. The, these can also be short courses. People will teach ATLS or smaller things like that. We'll give some examples of this. Humanitarian response is another common one, and this is when people respond to larger scale disasters, conflict zones, different types of settings like that that can get really complicated. There's a lot usually working with larger NGOs like Doctors Without Borders or 
International Medical Corps or different things like that. And we'll, t we'll talk about that in more detail and how ER doctors really have taken the lead in humanitarian response with a lot of these well-known organizations these days and how their ER doctors are actually really very desirable recruits for these organizations. And then research, there's a ton of work to be done in low resource settings in particular around the world, but also in higher resource settings. I want to be clear that international emergency medicine, while a lot of it is focused on low income countries or low middle income countries, there's a lot of work to be done in high middle income countries and high income countries too. It's, it's not all being in some rural low resource setting. It's really any anywhere. It was actually just today I saw on my Twitter feed that the country of Spain just today had emergency medicine approved as a specialty by Congress. So there's a lot of parts of the world that have no recognition of emergency medicine yet. And that's all part of what we do with international emergency medicine. But anyway, for research, there's I'll give some examples later on, but there's just so much work to be done to find out what works, what doesn't work in different settings. And, it, and it's really an exciting time because we're learning so much with it all. And it can be quite an academic field. Advocacy and policy is also a huge thing of what we do. And this is just letting people know what is emergency medicine. This is pretty similar to what we do here when people go to like the legislative advocacy conference in DC or things like that, or to meet with your Congress people and you tell them why we need emergency care for all the reasons that I'm not gonna repeat here that everybody's familiar with. But a lot of international emergency medicine is going to other countries and explaining why emergency care is important. What is emergency care? why these systems without emergency care struggle and helping them create policies that can build an emergency care system. And the last thing is systems development, which I'll also talk about in a little more detail in a few minutes. And the systems development issue is, so if somebody wants emergency care, an area, a government, municipality, how do you actually build it out? And that's a, a lot of our fellows and faculty, the, end up working on things like this and helping build these large scale systems that can support emergency care. Um, before I dive into those individually, probably the most common question that I get as a fellowship director is from residents asking me, why should I do a fellowship or is a fellowship right for me? Is, is something constantly that, that we hear. And the and it's a really good question. It's the same question I had when I was a resident not too long ago, of, whether or not I really need to do a fellowship and or should I just go sign up for Doctors Without Borders or you know do, do whatever. And these are the four reasons that I think of, of why a fellowship can help. And because international emergency medicine, you do get a skill set, but it's slightly different from fellowships in like, for example, PEM or even ultrasound to a degree, or definitely critical care, where you leave with a tangible asset that you later bring to your future department that makes you more valuable in some ways. Whereas international EM fellowships, it's a little less tangible because you have this skill set, but it doesn't necessarily benefit your future domestic ER employer or chief or chair. It benefits other people external to the system. So what we provide with fellowship is this exposure and network and opportunity to to learn about the larger systems at play of the humanitarian world of the UN system of the research structures in European research bodies or African research bodies or Asian and how to plug into these systems and do good research and that's ethically acceptable in different countries and just to show our fellows all the different things that they can do with this and how they can have some pretty massive scale impacts on the world by helping provide emergency care in areas where there is no emergency care and exposing them to as many things as possible. I, sometimes I describe a fellowship as it's for, for somebody that's a first, first year faculty member, if you just go right into a faculty job, it, it can be really hard because you're fighting for grants and trying to get funding and you're working all these shifts and it, you even though it's less shifts in residency it's still a lot of shifts and it it can you kind of run out of free time quick doing a fellowship gives you a year or two to have almost built-in buy down where you don't work as many shifts you can 
feel out the international field. You can travel, you can experience different different types of international EM, maybe do a disaster response, go work and help develop a residency somewhere, do a research project, go to the UN and see what you think is right for you. And it's like a low risk thing. You, you do that for a year or two, you're still working clinically back home and maintaining your clinical skills. And, and then you can decide, is this what you're gonna do? Do you wanna go work in humanitarian response or do you wanna work in academics or is this not for you and you stay in clinical medicine? So that's, I think, the big reasons to get to do a fellowship. It gives you that time to to kind of find yourself in the field and see if you really want to do it or not. And also, you get a lot of specific education. And we'll talk uh, at the end briefly about all the different types of courses that are offered. So, and then I'll quickly ask Rebecca and Parveen, because I've been doing all the talking, just as they've both been fellowship directors longer than I have. So I'm, I'm the most junior of the three of us. So to see what their answers to the questions of when they're approached by residents asking, should I do a, a fellowship in international emergency medicine or not? So maybe you guys want to chime in and say how you answer that question. Um, Rebecca, do you want to go first or should I? I'll go first. Oh, go for it. Yeah, so this is Parveen. I'm from uh, LA County, USC. Um, I actually worked with Sean. Um, I was Sean's fellowship director, believe it or not, an age ago. Um, I uh, so So I think this is, a you know, it is a question we're asked a lot. There is an opportunity cost. Certainly fellowships don't typically pay exactly the same as a faculty rate for full-time faculty because the program is gonna cover the expenses of education and experiences and travel and the like. Um, but the, you know, I, I think there, the biggest, the biggest thing for me that a fellowship brings is exposure to that broad network, a sense of what the breadth of opportunities are within global health for emergency physicians. And then I think the final thing is that though there is a lot of global health being done, um, you know, it, there's a very specific way to do global health in a high impact, sustainable and ethical way. And fellowships really train emergency physicians to understand how to do that. And I think that's probably the main reason to seek a fellowship. Um, it gives you a chance to sort of not only get a sense of how you wanna use your clinical skills in the most high impact way possible, but what skill set, it allows you to gather the skill sets to really be able to think about impact, you know, measure impact and, um, you know, sort of um, different exposure to different models to make it sustainable for you uh, in terms of a long-term career. So um, I, I was very, um, you know, it was only about a 10% chance I wanted to do a fellowship when I started applying for them. And then by the time I saw what, um, you know, what the opportunities were at the fellowship that I did, I was, um, you know, sort of 50%. And by the time I was done, I was 100% sold, and I've been uh, sold on the fellowship since. It's really um, unparalleled exposure and training. Yeah, I think um, the only thing I could think to add to those, because I agree with what Sean and Parveen have said, um, is that you know, for someone who maybe wants to go on an, one international trip every year or every other year to volunteer their clinical services as a physician, then, you know, that's the kind of thing that a fellowship maybe is unnecessary for. But if you are a person who is very driven in wanting to be involved with global health development, um, and in particular, if people are picky about those experiences or want to be able to have the role where they are actually designing and building those experiences and working for a nonprofit organization or a larger health system strengthening um, goals, then those are the roles that are, that are not possible to do without a larger set of network and experiences. And I think the fellowship really gives you a wide breadth of experiences to draw from. And so that's one thing that I think if you if to be a leader in the field now, there's so many different experiences you get during fellowship um, that you kind of fast forward a couple of years of experience just by doing the fellowships. Yeah, exactly. So so and, that, and that's something that I'm sure that you will all get as questions from residents asking, should I do a fellowship in general? Because it's always kind of weird because I always thought of emergency medicine when I went into it as it's like the anti fellowship specialty is that you just uh, you, you get to do a little bit of everything. That's why people go into EM. But I think 
an international fellowship if you're interested in working in the field of global health it definitely has added value for all those reasons so i'm going to move on to some examples now so direct clinical care now this is, I think, one of the, the best parts of international emergency medicine is that you get to go and provide care to patients that may not otherwise be able to get care from somebody who is trained in how to provide how to provide that care on a, on a good level. So it's probably one of the most satisfying things when you treat somebody that you know that otherwise wouldn't have been treated if, if you weren't there or the people that you trained to treat them aren't there. So, and one very tangible and real way that international emergency medicine is useful, not just for fellows, um, but also for residents that do international rotations or for faculty in many places will go and do a, a month or something that rotate through a program because you get to do a lot of procedures and skills and take care of a lot of medical conditions that you otherwise may not be able to. So like in, in this picture here, you can see it's doing an ultrasound guided pericardiosynthesis, which this is uh, this is in Haiti at a hospital that we work at, and and here this is a, a very common procedure that is done in the ER uh, frequently for many of the tuberculosis patients, and it, it allows you to build confidence and do skills you may otherwise not do very often. This photo is um, the small baby that was born a few hours earlier and um, had had a respiratory arrest, and. This, this is an example of two things. The first is many of us don't take care of uh, enough pediatrics. I know I definitely don't see many um, pediatrics and very, very few sick pediatric patients where I work. So, but when I work in other parts of the world, I'll take care of significant numbers of pediatric patients, many of which are critically ill. And it's great for my experience and my learning and building my confidence of taking care of pediatric patients but it's also great for the pediatric patients that get uh, get the care that they need. So it's really, I think, a win-win for everybody. And the second thing that this picture shows is the innovation that you get to learn. So, I mean, even in our ERs at home, you often, I feel like I can never find a piece of equipment that I need. So you end up kind of building things in the moment to get by. But in low resource settings, you have to take that a little further. And here, what is on this child's face is a uh, is bubble CPAP, which is a uh, basically a mini CPAP mask that we built. And you can see the nasal cannula. We cut it open, and one end is going into the oxygen tube, and the other end that's been cut open is now going into that's a little blood tube bottle, like a little vacutainer blood tube bottle that's filled halfway with water. And the whole idea is that as the oxygen runs through it bounces off the water and reflects pressure and provides CPAP. And you can adjust the amount of pressure just by changing the water level. So you kind of bootleg these devices that save lives. And it's really cool. And this actually procedure was published in, uh, in West Gem uh, last year. So you can see, you can actually turn into an academic event to teach others. And the third thing, this photo is from, the, uh, from one of the NGOs, NYC Medics, that a lot of ER doctors volunteered with in the past and particularly in the past year, this is in Iraq. And they um, they basically were working just outside of a conflict zone and a few kilometers outside of an active war zone and providing emergency care, mainly emergency trauma care. And here you can see they're in somebody's living room and they just, you provide medical care anywhere. So it's almost, I think, the most pure emergency medicine that you can do. You're truly providing care where care is needed most to people that otherwise can't get it and truly doing what needs to be done with whatever's available. And it's, it's kind of, I think, why a lot of us got into this job. And it's, a, it's, it's always just so satisfying to me. And when I, when I come home from a trip like this, I just feel like, wow, I was really a doctor and I really took care of people. And I think that's what draws a lot into this field. And fellowships can give people a lot of time to get, to protected time to get exposed to this, to work in all these different settings and decide if this is right for them. And, and also to find the many problems and many issues and many ways it can be improved and work to improve it because this is all a work in progress, all of it. Um, uh, like, sorry, I was gonna go ahead and add something, Sean, if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. If you wanted to add anything, please do. <laughs> this is Barbine again. 
So um, I know many of you probably manage students uh, and residents that have interest in, in global health. So just to say that, um, you know, the uh, one of the things I emphasize with my medical students, residents, and, and faculty that travel is uh, also just to ensure that when you do these trips, you know, you know um, all of the medicine that you practice is within your scope of practice, obviously, with that rare exception where it's a life-saving procedure and there's no other availability. Um, and then, um, you know, just taking into consideration local norms and standards, ensuring that you have appropriate licensing uh, and all of those things. And you'll notice, very skillfully, Sean made sure all of these pictures are, de all the patients are de-identified. So it's one of my other big teaching points to my, my traveling uh, advisees is to make sure that uh, de-identify patients or get consent. Yeah, exactly. And all the rules apply for ethics. It, um, it doesn't matter where you are. Just because you're in a different country or in somebody's living room providing care doesn't mean that you can suddenly do an X-lap. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that you can just take random photos of pa patients without consent. The, the baby in the upper right, we actually have on file a sign of consent from her mother. And the other ones, you can see the faces are obscured. But the, the, all the same rules still apply, and it's really important to remember that. And the ethics, the ethical challenges are actually far greater in the international setting, I think, and really makes us uh, it adds to the challenge, but also makes you work a little harder. So the, ne the next thing is, uh, I'll talk briefly about education and training, which is another big part of international fellowships. That when our fellows they They'll go places to provide direct clinical care, but a lot of it is really training because at the end of the day, most, if not all, of American trained ER doctors, they, they're going to go somewhere for a few weeks, months, maybe even years, but more likely than not, they're ultimately going to come back home, and with, with the rare exception. So what are you leaving behind? And that's really where education comes in. It's so important, and it's such a big part of what we do. The whole goal is that we're training other providers to give the care that needs to be given and local providers that now they can provide to their communities. My One of my mentors, she, um, she said that she knows her marker of success is when she doesn't when she's not needed anymore when they send her home and that that's when that's when her job is done when she's out of a job so it's not a good sustainability model but uh but it works and she her name is terry reynolds she created the the residency program the first er residency in africa in dar es salaam and which now she doesn't work there anymore because they've graduated so many classes of residents that now they have enough er specialists that are tanzanian er doctors and that's the kind of the whole success is that we put ourselves out of business our work is, and then then the work is done. So here, this is just an example in the in Haiti at the Mirabelle Partners in Health Training Program of teaching the residents. Uh, there we have a three-year residency program and teaching the residents how to do IOs. And yeah, again, I get to be a little innovative. I asked one of the um, one of the house ladies if she could get uh, get me some a whole bunch of chicken feet. So they were a little different than the ones that I pick up at the food store here in Boston to teach the residents. And uh, got the same thing though, and they're just practicing with the old IO IO choke cards because we didn't have drills. And you see on the top here, I say from the public to the specialist. And that's a really important part of education in international emergency medicine. Most places, the the old, best overwhelming majority of healthcare in the is in the world is not provided by doctors. It's provided by nurses or some sort of other healthcare officer or technician. And a lot of the training that we do is not to physicians, but it's to nurses or really to anybody that will listen to us. We taught a class recently in Uganda and we had um, some of the janitors said, can we sit in on the class? And we said, yeah, well, of course, if you want to learn how to stop bleeding, I mean, why not? So it's teaching everybody because the whole goal is just to get emergency care to anybody that can need it. So it, the education really spans from short courses, week-long courses, things like that, all the way to full-blown residency programs, which you can imagine are all different scales of investment and involvement. This is a, an example of, of uh, one project that we did with the WHO and ICRC, and this is the basic emergency care course, which has been rolled out now in a few countries. And it's just a five-day course on how to do the ABCDE survey and basic care of trauma patients and shock patients and difficulty breathing patients. Simple stuff that saves lives. And this was done by several international EM fellows from several programs around the country actually uh, participated in it. And this is a good example of 
how international fellows spend their time doing training, doing clinical care, but then also creating books and materials that will train the future generations to come. And it, it's, a, I think, a pretty good example of what fellows do. This down at the bottom right is just another example of a residency program. This is the program in Tanzania at Mouhin Billy, which is now essentially self-sufficient and people still rotate through. But the first time I went here, it was as we were teaching people and now you go and you just observe because we just get in the way. And, uh, and that's a sign of success. And it's a, but it's still a good place for fellows to go and learn. And now though, they learn from the Tanzanian doctor um, other ways to do things and how how tropical medicine is treated and things like that, conditions they don't usually see. And it's, uh, I think it's, now it's really cool because the training goes both ways. And this last picture is just an example. This is a room full of uh, nurses and nursing students in Uganda learning how to do a primary assessment and uh, getting ready to log roll the patient to check his back for the um, fake, uh, fake traumatic injury. And you can just see this picture I love because you can just see the interest on everybody's face. And there, there's just such a want for teaching and for knowledge because this is a, a small district hospital on a highway that has very little resources and sees the most unbelievable car accidents that you could imagine. And people just show up in pickup trucks and they literally just bleed to death. And the hospital workers just, they just want to be able to take care of the people that are injured. And they were so excited to have this training. And it, it's just such a great thing because then you go back and visit and they tell you all the stories of how they put on a tourniquet, how they splinted somebody's arm. And, uh, and it's really cool. You can make a really big difference. And then you watch them teach it to the next generation. And that's what it's all about. And this is all stuff that our fellows do in, the different, in our different programs. The next thing, which is a big component of fellowships, is humanitarian response. And I want to point out that this is different from domestic disaster response, which, which uh, many people are probably familiar with, and working with like FEMA or the um, different um, Department of Health organizations in the U.S. and respond to things. That's very important, and there are domestic disaster response fellowships as well. But humanitarian response in the international sense is a little different. This picture on the left just shows how healthcare is one small little piece of it. You can see at the top, this is the, the UN cluster system that's used to coordinate large-scale disasters like what's happening right now in Yemen or in Syria or in the Mediterranean or the Ebola outbreak that's hopefully it's wrapping up in Western DRC. So this is how things all come together. And you can see at the top, there's one little piece of health and it's just one small piece of the puzzle. And that's what's really important to realize with humanitarian response is that just because we're doctors doesn't mean that we, we know it all or that we're actually even that useful. Health is one piece of the puzzle. And what we train in the fellowships is how how emergency physicians fit into this bigger picture and how you can go and be useful and not just be some random volunteer with a duffel bag that's showing up and getting in the way. And, and, uh, and we feel confident that our fellows with the training that they get, they go on and work for UN organizations or UNICEF or the WHO or, or MSF or any of these organizations in there. They really contribute to the overall picture of humanitarian response. Part of the education that fellows get in international fellowships is how to properly respond to a disaster, which there's standards that are internationally agreed upon, such as the SPHERE standards is a big one. And we make sure that our fellows are properly trained in all the ethics and response protocols that when they do go out to the field, they're educated and ready to go. And this last picture is just an example. This is MSF in the Mediterranean, but many NGOs, I'm just using MSF as an example, They've, they've realized the benefit that ER doctors bring to humanitarian response. ER doctors have a really unique skill set of understanding the whole system and a diverse approach to medical and trauma and are incredibly useful for these organizations and are really highly recruited. And many of our fellows go on to work for organizations like this. And I'll let Parveen, who's one of her faculty, is actually on one of these boats right now. So maybe she'll say something about it. Yeah, sure. So um, one of our faculty, um, we've actually got um, the current um, doctor on the Aquarius. So many of you may have read about the Aquarius, which is the um, SOS Mediterranean and uh, MSF staff boat that does rescues of migrants trying to escape the really horrible conditions in Libya. Um, 
and they were blocked from the port in Italy. And uh, ultimately, after about you know several days at sea, had to had to go to Spain. And more recently, they, were, they just got to dock there. But um, David Beversluis is one of our faculty and um, splits his time half time with MSF and half time with us. Um, he's been doing that for the past year or so. The, um, Dave's a really good example, actually, of somebody that's made a really successful career doing global health without a fellowship. And so I think the other thing that we can serve, um, you know, the, the, the three of us and certainly others that are um, a part of the International Emergency Medicine Consortium, uh, we can serve as resources for residents that are considering their options. Generally, connect people to, you know, faculty members that have taken all kinds of pathways. So, and the last thing I want to dive into is just briefly is the research aspect, and just to show that international emergency medicine is actually a very academic field, and and I think will become much more so as the years go by because there's such a need for understanding what works and what doesn't work in emergency care in, in the low resource settings across the world. And this is just some examples. This first study was just published in Lancet Global Health not too long ago. And it was it's incredible they mapped out with GIS all the all the hospitals in Africa and they found that a third of the population lives more than two hours from a hospital. Just showing and those hospitals don't even necessarily have emergency care in them. And just showing the, the incredible, incredible need for emergency care and how much work has to be done. And then the next one is an example of, of how you can test specific treatments in lower resource settings and see if they work. This is ketamine, for example, which is the, really the sedative of choice in much of the world because it's so safe and effective. And it's one thing to say, yeah, this is safe and effective, but you take it to the next level and you study it and you do a trial and you get IRB approval, not just at home, but in country. And you work here, you can see these, the author list here is a perfect example of mentors from the US, pharmacists, and then then Henry and Juma, who they were, they were in the first class of residence in Tanzania. And now they're both faculty members and Henry actually run, he's the program director for the residency now in Tanzania. And it's just such a success story of how you can create these amazing training programs that now turn out their own research and advance, uh, advance emergency care in all these different areas. And another cool thing is how to, uh, how to really function in low resource settings. This is just a paper they published using uh, cassava flour slurry to make ultrasound gel because ultrasound gel turns out is really expensive when you gotta get it shipped to the other side of the world one bottle at a time and people go through it. So they found some local supplies and then they did a randomized trial and and proved that they can just use this flower slurry for ultrasound gel. So making things that are usually not sustainable now completely sustainable and affordable. So it's, a, it's just another really cool idea of how to not just innovate, but make it academic and research as well, generate publications. A well-known thing that a lot of people participate in is the, the GEMLAR, the Global Emergency Medicine Review, which is an annual review that um, Adam Levine started at Brown and now has, I think, probably 20 to 25 people are on the team every year and, and doing different different jobs. And it's, a, it's really a great way for people to get exposure to research. And this is something that um, residents can get involved in now. So if you have residents in in your program that are interested in global health, you tell them just to Google the, the Global Emergency Medicine Literature Review and they can apply. And it's a good way to get plugged into the larger system and get some research experience from some pretty good mentors. And this next one is uh, just showing the impact that emergency medicine can have. And this is uh, some international emergency medicine specialists that wrote it, that were on a committee that wrote this article for Lancet that came out a few months ago that is the evidence-based guidelines of how to care for Ebola patients and has now become the international standard of Ebola treatment, all based on research from all of the ER doctors that responded to Ebola in West Africa back in 2014, 2015. They didn't just treat patients the whole time when they took time off of their home ER jobs. They studied everything and now they're publishing and creating these guidelines that are literally saving lives right now. And it's just incredible the, the impact that this can have. And finally, just 
looking at different risk factors and you see so much more advanced disease and different age groups that you can create rules and that what they did here at this hospital in Peru is trying to create predictive rules of which kids are going to decompensate faster but doing it with low resources and triage settings and then showing that it can actually save lives. So this is just a very small example of all the different research work that's done that our fellows engage in and um, and residents can get involved in even before fellowship and they should if they're interested in international emergency medicine. The um, last thing I'll dive into deeply is system development. And this is looking at the whole emergency care system. So you can see this picture here. This is from the WHO and the emergency care system framework that's been developed. And and because when you go somewhere in the world where there is no emergency care, the, you start to describe it and you, it's kind of hard to describe because you realize it's so much more than just the ER. And if you look at this picture, you see the hospital in the ER is just the upper right corner. But there's all these other things. And this is a really great diagram, I think, because it shows the accident happens on the left. You see the bystander calling for help. The dispatcher sends an ambulance. The ambulance is trained and have equipment and treats the patient, brings the patient to the hospital, hands over the patient, and then the hospital has an emergency unit that can receive the patient and so on and so forth. And this was all made, this actual diagram right here was built by International Emergency Medicine Fellows from different programs that sat around and made it as part of their fellowship project. And now it's a WHO tool. So it's, it's really cool, the different, um, different things that fellows can get involved with and all the different learning opportunities that they have. And it's also cool that International Emergency Medicine fits into this much larger picture, a lot like the humanitarian response where healthcare is just one small sliver of that wheel of all the other things that need to be done. This is the sustainable development goals of the SDGs, which are the kind of the UN goals that they want to achieve by 2030. And you can see number three is the big one here is, is, is health is the big one that we did, that we work on in emergency care. But we're part of it. You become part of this bigger family that's working on all these ways to just improve life in general for people in the world. And we contribute our part and we're the healthcare people at the table, but you get to interact and meet with all these other amazing people that are just trying to make the world a better place. That's one of the really cool things I think about International EM Fellowship is getting people involved in that. So next and kind of the last few things as we, as we wrap up here is talk about the components of a fellowship. And I wanna do this broadly as what if you're looking for a fellowship or you have a resident that's asking you say, I want to do an international fellowship and there's all these ones out there, what things should you look for in a good fellowship, in a high quality fellowship? And these are the things that I that come to mind when people ask me, what should I look for? This is what I tell them. So you should look at what is the clinical commitment? So how much do they want you to work clinically? Of course you need to work a fair amount, you need to work enough that you build your skills. One of the big perks of doing a fellowship and not just going to work for say a UN agency or something is that in a fellowship you can still work clinically. And most people, I know I felt this way right after residency, you want to go work as an attending a little bit. You want to put your skills to the test and, and your learning really begins almost once you're a new attending. So make sure that you're going to work enough clinically and that you're gonna be challenged, but you also don't wanna go somewhere as a fellow, quote unquote, and you're gonna be working 15 shifts a month, or you're gonna be working only nights and weekends, or you're only gonna work at their very undesirable community site, 45 minutes outside of the city. So make sure that you're treated as an equal with the other faculty, that you get to work desirable shifts and that you're not working every day, because if you're just gonna work all the time, then there's probably no point doing a fellowship. The, Departmental support can't be stated enough. You want to go somewhere where they have a track record of supporting global health, which isn't everywhere. And that's fine because many hospitals and many systems, they have a mission and their mission may be to the community. If it's a certain county hospitals, their mission is very much to take care of the citizens in their area. And that's fine. And other places, their mission is more outward looking for global health. So it's important to look at what is the mission of the system and what track record do they have of supporting global health activities? Because if you go somewhere as an international fellow and there's no support to allow you to do international things, it's not going to be a very good fellowship. Look at the finances. And by that, I mean not how much you're going to get paid because, of course, as a fellow, you're going to get paid less. And 
it's it's not so much your salary, but it's what kind of support are you going to get when you do a trip? So if you go to, if you get deployed to do a disaster response somewhere, are you paying for your plane tickets out of your CME fund that you should be using to pay for your boards? So make sure that there's a good reimbursement structure. If there is an MPH involved and you're going to get a master's degree, well, are you paying for that? How is that happening? So make sure that all of the money adds up and that there's adequate support. Because remember, you're working clinically in a way you're paying for yourself. Make sure that you're not being taken advantage of. It should be a, it should be a win-win for everybody, for the department and for the fellow. Make sure that there's good research infrastructure. Make sure that there's going to be mentorship, that there's support if people are going to get grants or that there's seed grants or something to get a fellow started on a research track so they can build a track record, particularly if they're planning on getting an academic faculty job after the fellowship. Look into the travel. Where do they go? Do, do past fellows just all go to one site and maybe that's fine? Or does the person want to go all over the world and you find a fellowship that has a lot of different sites or a lot of different options? And lastly, look at the education. It's not just about becoming a fellow, working a few shifts and jumping on a plane and going to X country. It's about having formal education on how to properly function in these areas. And you want to do a fellowship that's going to provide that education, whether it's through an MPH, through short courses or other programs like that. Sean, can I add one more component to think Please. about? Please. Um, the other thing about is, um, you know, it's really important to understand where fellows kind of end up in any given program, and, and that's sort of related to the components of a fellowship. So, for example, there are fellowships where, you know, residents are, or sorry, uh, gra uh, graduates, uh, sorry, fellows are focusing more on a breadth of experience. There are fellowships that are really more, you know, kind of strategically designed for fellows that really want to work in a particular subspecialty within international emergency medicine. So maybe they really want to focus on building a residency. And so they may, you know, find that um, a fellowship that's aligned with, you know, initiatives to build residencies in other countries really suits them. So, um, you know, I, I think the nice thing about the International Emergency Medicine Fellowship is that, you know, that's not, there's not a one size fits all. There's a lot of really great fellowships across the country that meet the individual residents needs. So this is an example of some of the courses that people end up taking and many fellowships offer these courses because they're offered by other organizations. So this is the HELP course, um, which is the um, healthcare uh, emergencies in large populations offered by the Red Cross. It's offered in different parts of the world, in Geneva, in Baltimore, Hawaii, um, and uh, there's and, and several other places. And this is a great two-week course that many fellows will take. So you want to make sure when you're looking at a fellowship, that they offer some training that's accepted generally like and this is the type of training where you take this course for two weeks it will get you up to speed on how to function in the humanitarian environment so that you can show up at a humanitarian event or working for an organization and you understand the bigger system and you can you can function properly <clears throat> this is a, a, a similar type of course that's done here in boston another two-week type training course that we offer our fellows and that several other fellowships send their fellows to it humanitarian response intensive course. And this is just a training people take for two weeks of class time and then they have a weekend long simulation in the woods where there's a basically a fake humanitarian emergency is created in a state park and it's a huge simulation for a training experience. The United Nations offers multiple online free training programs as do other organizations. So one that we make our fellows take is the, is the security in the field courses because it's really the responsibility of the fellowship to make sure that their fellows are going to be safe and taken care of because if something happens in the field, you need to have a plan to get them out or to help them take care of themselves. So we require everybody to take these free courses on security. Uh, the, there's different leadership courses, international emergency leadership courses that people can take. The building a better response is, is a very popular course. It's also online and free and that people can take to learn how to function in the, human, in the humanitarian sphere and in the international setting. And, or there's the tropical medicine courses that are offered and there are several different ones. The Glorious course is one of the more popular ones. And these courses are of varying length where people can go and learn how to treat tropical disease that we don't often see in the US. And this course in particular is unique because you, 
sit in the classroom for half the day and then you go and actually do the medicine right after. So it's, it's pretty cool. And it, no one fellowship offers all of these programs. Different fellowships have different kind of pieces to the puzzle that they put together. So look around and have your fellows look around and you can decide what is the right fit for them and what are the different pros and cons. But it's important to know all the different options that are out there. There are some different models of fellowships for international EM. So probably one of the biggest distinctions is there's one year fellowships and two year fellowships. The majority are two years. Some are one years, like ours, for example, if you have a master's of public health, you do a one year fellowship. But if you don't have a master's of public health, you do a two year fellowship. And as part of that, you do an MPH. So some programs have things like that. So you can decide the pros and cons of one year versus two year. One year goes very fast and you can only get so much done. But at the same time, it's less of an opportunity cost than a two-year fellowship. So everybody will have their different approach to this. Different fellowships offer different graduate degrees. The most common degree offered is an MPH that most many, many programs offer. But some offer different ones. Like, for example, Yale's program sends their fellows to the London School of Hygiene. And, um, and they, do a, they do their public health degree there. So it's, there's all kinds of different interesting approaches that are done. And if somebody has an MPH, many programs will offer an MPA or an MPP or several other different types of degrees. So you can look at the different degree offerings. And when you do, though, just make sure that your resident who's applying figures out the finances and make sure those can be reimbursed. Because that's one of the biggest reasons to do a fellowship to get a master's degree out of it. Different fellowships have different clinical requirements. I kind of touched on this already, that um, some you work more, some you work less, some you work at the academic mothership, some you don't, and you work at the community site. So make sure that you, uh, that you look at all the details before you decide what's right for you. And probably one of the biggest things is what I think of as project flexibility. So many fellowships will already have their pet project or projects that their faculty are working on. And you have to decide, are your interests totally aligned with what their faculty are doing? And if your interests are not aligned, are the faculty going to support you doing something else? So some fellowships are very flexible and will let the fellow kind of choose their own adventure and support them through whatever they want to do and just help them find opportunities. And others are less so and, and they'll say, no, you're here to work on this project with us. And that's fine if that's what the fellow is interested in, but just to make sure you know what you're signing up for. So the other, yes. <laughs> sorry, so, yeah. no, please. One more consideration is the amount of time that the average fellow spends in the field uh, and how much time they get towards a project that they've chosen. So just another thing to consider. Yeah, exactly. How much time you get to travel can vary pretty widely. So really kind of just now in the home stretch here, I promise. And just my little plug of why I think emergency physicians are the perfect fit for this sort of work. So, I mean, a lot of people probably read, read this book that's been out there now, which if you haven't, you should, it's great. But this is what we do. It's we do anything, anywhere, anytime. And really it's more than that for anybody, for any problem, whatever it needs, whether, whether they can pay or not, whether it's 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. And that's one of the things I love about emergency medicine and why I chose it. And I think that really we broaden that to the whole world. Why stop just at our front doors? And international emergency medicine lets you do that, lets you really push yourself and test your skills and test your creativeness in a way, creativity. So there's, ER doctors have this incredible broad knowledge. I mean, we, we can handle anything that comes to the doors, at least for the first, you know, half hour, hour, and our skill set and our ability to just confront the problem and say, I'm not quite sure what's going on, but we're going to do something about it. And uh, and that skill set just translates so well to the international setting. I would argue better than any other medical specialty, which is which is why it's, this is such a great job for emergency physicians. Emergency physicians understand the system in a way that other specialties just don't, in my opinion. And the reason is because we are constantly trying to fight the system. We're dealing with different specialties, services that don't want to admit a patient or that are full or that can't come in at 3 a.m. We understand all the, the whole 
big system that the ER functions as the center of. And that system knowledge translates really well to creating and running a hospital in X country. Or if you go work for MSF and they put you in charge of a health center because ER doctors get all the different intricacies of the different specialties and the needs and understand patient flow through a hospital like no other specialty. So doing international emergency medicine is an opportunity to really capitalize on those skills. One thing I think that goes under-recognized sometimes that is so important is that we speak the language of all the specialties. And just think of your last ship. You, maybe you got on the phone with a urologist and you talked to them about what type of wine color the urine was. And then after that, you got on the phone with a primary care doctor and talked about the preventative maintenance plan for a patient. After that, you talked to the PICU about their strategy for taking care of a patient. And then you called the surgeon and, talk, and told them the exact things they wanted to know. And you do that, and we do this every day. We do it seamlessly that we know what the urologist wants to hear when we call them versus what the PCP wants to hear versus what the ICU wants to hear versus what the cardiologist wants to hear. And that allows us to drop into any of these places and be able to work right away with all the different providers and to fit in pretty well. And it's, it's a great skill set, again, that makes us good for this job. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, is emergency medicine is the, is the public face of the healthcare system. We're the front door of the hospital. We're the only place that takes a patient without checking their insurance card before we start treating them and that does the turn, right, turn away patients. And that culture and that ability to just handle everything is what really prepares us to be able to function in these environments better than any other specialty. And organizations are realizing this. Over the years, MSF and other organizations have really turned their attention toward recruiting ER doctors. And the reason is because of these, these skill sets that we bring to the table. So who do we, what do we look for in an applicant? if you have somebody that's applying to international EM. Um, well, the first thing is always tell them to please reach out. If you have a resident that is considering applying to an international EM fellowship, always feel free to cold email any fellowship director, wherever in the region, whatever in the country they may be looking. And I, I think I can speak for all the fellowship directors by saying that we'd all be happy to answer any email and to just explain, to help to help explain what our fellowship is and give them some advice because we, we really want to provide not just a great fellowship experience, but just improve the field and provide the mentorship that's needed out there. So the strongest applicant, I think the most important thing is you got to have a really good attitude to work in this field. Global health gets kind of messy and things are chaotic and you got to be able to roll with the punches. You have to be incredibly flexible and deal with a, a, a constantly shifting environment and, and changing plans. You have to be w willing to work really, really hard and long hours and under jet lag and without the right resources and maybe through several translators sometimes. But that's what it's all about. Maybe without electricity and maybe while you know, you're getting bit by mosquitoes and all these things. But that's what makes it great in a way. And then of course, all the other things. We want people that are smart and have good letters of recommendation and stuff like that. But really the first three are the most important. And I think what makes this fellowship a little unique, this International Emergency Medicine Fellowships. So if you have people, this is how they apply. We have a website. They can check it out. Um, you can check it out. It's uh, iemfellowships.com. This is just a screenshot of the homepage. If you click on the programs button in the center there, it will take you to a list of all the different programs. Uh, the website is under a little bit of construction, so um, but it, you should be able to take a look at it and look at the different programs and see what's out there. And if they want to apply, they uh, would email their individual fellowships and all the instructions are on the website. There's 36 fellowships right now in the United States and um, actually 35 in the US and one in Canada. Um, this is a list on the right. So if, uh, if, if you are nearby one of these or if you're giving advice to your residents, you can tell them this is all the different places they can look at and to contact and every fellowship is different. They all offer unique things, so I encourage you to check out their websites. Besides the IEM Fellowships website, most have uh, their own website, too, that you can check out to get more information. And like I said, I wouldn't hesitate to email the fellowship director or whatever leadership email is on the web page to get more information. And I, I would say that most would be pretty happy to speak with you to share information about it.
so that's it thank you guys so much and um, for paying attention and for taking the time this evening to learn more about international emergency medicine fellowships and please we'll take some questions but uh, of course also you can email us and please feel free to pass our emails on to any of residents or other people that you think are interested in this field that have more questions be happy to answer those too okay thank you all very much for a very enlightening presentation i would like to open the floor up to any questions if any of our listeners have any questions please feel free okay so i'm going to ask one question for our presenters uh, one challenge that we seem to encounter when residents are looking to do international em or global health electives is the issue of malpractice insurance and I was wondering if you could provide some guidance on how to navigate some of those challenges. Um, yeah, a, you want to take that part again? Uh, no, go ahead. Oh. So, um, so that goes to doing it. You can't just get on a plane and go somewhere. And you, and when you see small organizations, I think they're the ones that run into these problems sometimes. And that's why it's important to go with a larger organization that's established. If you go and work for, I keep using MSF as an example, like if you work with Doctors Without Borders or International Medical Corps or any of these organizations, they cover you with malpractice insurance and that, that you're protected. Or, or if you go work in, at the Partners in Health Hospital or you work with different government systems and you're providing direct clinical care, first of all, you should be licensed in that country. You can't just show up and take and provide care. So you there's different mechanisms that people will get a medical license sometimes programs will have a blanket license that they can apply at their discretion but it should be in writing and issued by the government and then part of that is they should be providing malpractice so it's it should be covered and if it's not covered then i think that probably shouldn't be going um just like with the medical license uh, certain disaster settings uh have an exception so many times when there's a very large scale disaster um on the scale of like, for example, Syria or Iraq or some, or Ebola, something like that, the government will, there's a formal mechanism where they will suspend the need uh, to issue medical licenses and they will offer humanitarian temporary medical license to providers based on the license of their home country. And they'll usually, as part of that, there should be language in the contract of malpractice, but that's something that people should be looking for and make sure that they are protected because the, the rules are in some ways the same everywhere in the world that people expect that good care will be given to them and people will be held accountable if, if that's not the case. The, um, the policy at uh, the University of Southern California, and so what I would say is check it with your institution um, and every fellowship should have a plan. So for our fellowship, for example, all of our faculty are at Keck School of Medicine and Keck covers all activities of faculty abroad. And so that's just done. Now what's interesting is our residency is paid by LA County. And they do not get malpractice for being abroad. In fact, you know, it, it's challenging for our residents to, you know, actually practice clinical medicine if they're in a non-county setting. So um, I think it's institution specific, but uh, you know, a fellowship, if you're, if you're within the context of a fellowship, they should have it sorted out. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the participants? I think one of the um, problems the program directors have when they have residents who are interested in global health fellowships is helping them identify um, maybe where these areas of expertise are or how well a fellowship might fit their goals, especially if their goals are somewhat undifferentiated. What would you recommend to the program director who's struggling to kind of provide support for the resident who's still not really sure which area of global health that they're really maybe interested in focusing on. I think that's a, a big reason to do a fellowship. And I was kind of alluding to that a little bit that different some fellowships are different. Some are some are very narrowly focused on one thing, whether that thing may be disaster response or development or policy or EMS, but others are very broad and and there are several that will force like we actually in ours we, we force our fellows no matter what they're interested in they have to do a displaced population they have to go to an educational development type setting and they have to do a disaster response as part of the fellowship and it forces exposure to these 
three very different areas of international EM. And sometimes people say, oh, wow, I never thought about that and I really like it. Or they say, oh, I thought I would like that and I really don't. It's kind of like third year of medical school, you know, um, <laughs> when, you, when you realize, like, wow, I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, but I actually don't. Um, but uh, but anyway, I think, and it's to be hard, I, I'd say the first step is the websites, scour their websites, look mm -hmm. at their faculty. There's usually bios of what people do, projects. And, um, and then I would say, if you have somebody in your shop that that is plugged into the international field, talk to them because they'll usually know the lay of the land. And if not, then reach out to one of us and put them in touch with us. And we can say, like, I feel confident that I could probably direct people to different fellowships based on what their interests are or, or aren't. That's really helpful. Thank you. I would say that I think the most important step is to connect somebody to um, a, a place with an international emergency medicine fellowship. And I think probably a longer established fellowship because, um, you know, I, I was at UCLA when I was a, a resident and I had people that had done fellowships. I had people that did some global health work. Not everybody kind of downplayed the value of a fellowship. And I ended up at the Brigham doing their fellowship. And, you know, it opened up an entire world to me and my career, you know, just became, you know, I, every opportunity I've had stemmed from that. Um, so I think, I think connecting to people that really know is probably really important. Terrific. I would agree. And some of these programs that do have global health program, if they can, if the resident can go to, maybe they don't have time to go abroad, but if they can even go to meetings about projects to hear um, what role they could see themselves taking. And in the same way you go through medical school and kind of see what your personality connects with someone else in a different specialty. Um, if they can kind of picture themselves having a role that someone that they can look up to a mentor in global health, if they can picture themselves having that role, then maybe they're sort of gravitating towards being involved with humanitarian aid response or disaster response or education programs or health system strengthening. And so, but I agree with Sean and Parveen that fellowship is sort of a, a time when most people aren't totally differentiated completely and mm -hmm. they may come with a certain interest and leave with it hyper focused or even a full 360 degree um, change. And so that's okay for them not to know. But if they are passionate in global health, you know, there are more fellowships now. We have more fellowships than we have um, applicants. And so it's a it's really a golden age for residents mm -hmm. to take advantage of that because the the time that as Sean has mentioned, that emergency medicine is sort of at the forefront of global health on the world stage with the WHO now having an, a department of emergency medicine. And so it's really a, a unique time for that for them. That's great. Thank you. OK, any last questions? OK, I would like to thank our speakers for providing us this session tonight. Thank you very much. It was very informative. We look forward to seeing all of you at our next Cord Connect session, which is scheduled for July 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern time.